very fortunate to be at the world premiere of the piece in Amsterdam in June and attended a talk that Shedrin gave just beforehand about the piece and what his ideas were. And exactly as you say, there were elements, as he, came, he said, as he came to think about writing the piece, immediately the, the, the similarity of the oboe to the human voice being one of the most vocal instruments that there is and the pastoral connotations, those first came to mind. But then he, it spun off into a lot of other things. He found himself taken back in his imagination to his youth and particularly the period of time he spent in the town of Alexin, which is on the river, uh, on the by river Oka, I think, and um, in the country and, and, and all that sort of thing. And so yes, the pastoral associations are there, but also um, the, the humanity of the instrument. And he wanted to portray uh, the relationship of the human voice uh, perhaps in more than one voice, and there are a number of places where there are duets with the English horn. So he was thinking of perhaps two female voices, one high and one low, perhaps in other places, with the tuba and the cadenza, the high voice and the low voice. So there's, there's, there's lots of that, but as you say, there are so many other things as well. The traditional sardonic humour that you get in a lot of um, Russian music by Soviet, uh, Soviet composers and uh, other things like that. And talking about the, te the writing, the technical writing for this instrument, I mean, Shadrin is not someone who pulls his punches, is he? No, uh, when I first heard that, um, that the RLPO and Concert Gura had commissioned this work, I was thinking, I wonder what it's going to be like, because what little I do know of his music is it's very quirky, it's unpredictable, it's um, sometimes rather strange and uh, encompasses many different styles. So you couldn't say, oh yes, well, we know what we're going to get there. And, and uh, when, the, when the piece first arrived in a manuscript score, which I could barely read, it was quite difficult to see what was there. I could see it was very, uh, fairly tricky in places. But then as I've got to know the piece, it's, um, there's a lot of, it's unmistakably Russian. It's got huge uh, traditional Russian things and it. it's very powerful for a start, unusually so for an oboe concerto in that he scored it for enormous orchestra. Um, and there are times when the orchestra just absolutely lets fly. And in those places, he doesn't ask me to play. <laughs> and uh, he, he's asked, he's lets the oboe rest during those moments. of the oboe writing, it's, it's not the most difficult concerto I've ever done, um, or the most difficult solo piece. There are certainly others that, that are more taxing technically, though it has its technical moments. But what he does ask you to do is, is to, there's, it's like a journey through the work, a, a spiritual journey, or cyclic, cyclical in a way, but in, in, it could also be unraveled as a start to the finish kind of life story and, and it finishes really up in the end with a great big question mark. And in that time he asks you to do uh, just about everything you can imagine. Um, storytelling, um, dramatic outbursts, uh, consolation, uh, and at the end, a, a sort of a lot of reflective looking back, but really, as I say, it doesn't come to any conclusion. The conclusion has to be in the mind of the listener. And, and you've touched on this, but many people thinking of a concerto and a concerto for a solo instrument might think, well, what we're going to have here is a work in which we have a solo instrument pitted, as it were, against the mm -hmm. orchestra. But there's far more into play in this, this, this work, isn't there? It's yes, important part of it. I was reminded when uh, I first played the Strauss concerto here with Marek Janowski, our chief conductor at the time, he said this isn't a concerto for oboe and orchestra, it's a concerto for oboe with wind serenade, wind ensemble and string accompaniment, a very subtle way of understanding the, the way the piece is put together. And in this case, we've got something similar. We've got um, a key relationship between the oboe and the cor anglais, uh, which, which comes several times through the piece, a slightly less uh, um, frequent one with the tuba, but then there are very few places where I can, I really feel I can let my hair down as a soloist and just go off and do what I like. And in fact, Vasily and I were talking in rehearsal about where those moments were. Um, he, he felt the cadenza passage, which is never really completely on my own, but he felt there that the music should be more free and, and, and we've put that into practice. Um, but a lot of the time it's very detailed. I found going through the score, I was writing cues in almost every bar as to what was going on because Shedrin has a very intricate way of writing voices coming in and colouring um, the, the various things that the other is doing, particularly toward the end where um, it sounds like it's very um, lightly scored and very delicate. But actually, if you look carefully, you can see uh, muted trumpet, crotals, 
and the, and the cor anglais together with string notes, all just providing this very transparent, or translucent kind of texture, which makes the oboe sound seem to glow from within. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Well, I, I thank you for drawing my attention to that moment. There are many moments I'd love to draw listeners to, because I think there's some really mm. wonderful things in it. But, yeah. but perhaps just one is is the opening, yeah. in which the, open, the, the solo oboe suddenly appears, the texture from which it appears. Could you just tell us what's mm. going on in there, because I think it's magical. Yes, it's an extraordinary beginning. The violas just go at it as if they've been waiting all day to make this, this strong crotchet statement that they, they begin with and everyone joins in. Then the very high uh, entrance, which is actually me, the orchestral oboes, the muted trumpets, and probably other people as well, a, a very dramatic phrase that, that drops and leaps back up again, and they all gradually die out and just leave me with a little poignant falling phrase. The, and again, uh, Shedrin asked, asked the oboe to go down quite low and then way back up to a very, very high note and sustain, you know, and then stop. It's almost, the, 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 the piece there, almost in that first phrase, is a microcosm of the whole work. 